Hello and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Duzdan Shah uh, Straight Talk, an Azerbaijani news channel uh, operating from Washington, D.C. I welcome you all. I know that uh, our English language content is light. We don't always speak English here. Our main languages are Azerbaijani and Russian. But increasingly, we're trying to appeal to a larger audience. And I thank you in advance if you've become uh, our subscriber and if you support our channel's work. Um, uh, briefly about the interview today, it's a, our great honor to have Dr. Gerard uh, Liberidian, uh, pardon me. Um, m many of you will know him, many of you will recognize the name, but I will remind you that he was a deputy foreign minister of Armenia, uh, forgive me, deputy foreign minister of Armenia, senior advisor and secretary of the Security Council and ambassador at large. And I'm pretty sure that Dr. Liberidian can tell us a lot about uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, the way uh, things happened at the time he was serving in Armenia, in the Armenian government. And we would like to talk about the aftermath of the Karabakh war. Our audience, people who are familiar with our work, will know that we um, don't... There are no answers we want to hear from our guests, basically. We try to do our work in as objectively as we can. Our goal is to look at the situation at large to see what happened. We thought that after the war in Nagorno-Karabakh, the subject will sort of fade from the headlines. Maybe it did in some parts of the world, but for the people of Armenia and Azerbaijan, it is pretty much there. It is pretty much uh, the number one thing on their minds. And we're mindful of that. We were the first channel to extend invitations to our colleagues uh, in Armenia, to influencers and observers in Armenia, so we, so we could have an honest and direct conversation without the uh, magical thinking uh, world of the Russian media. Talk directly. We are happy to continue this tradition today, and we hope that uh, the words of our guest will be treated with respect the way we treat them. Um, I hope that this channel and this chat and the commentary, uh, comments afterwards, do not become a competition in pedestrian language. You know that we frown upon that, and uh, the users who uh, permit themselves to sort of uh, <laughs> test the boundaries, they get uh, blocked. Very pure and simple. This is a warning to the audience, and I appreciate uh, your attention. Dr. Liberidian, I tried to not botch your <laughs> titles as much as I could. Welcome to our show. Um, I would like to say how honored we are that you found time for us. Uh, thank you for your time, and um, we're happy to see you here. Thank you very much, Mr. Jarilov. <laughs> I asked you to call me a smile. Please be as informal as you may. Um, Dr. Liberidian, there are many million-dollar questions when it comes to the aftermath of the war. I was, uh, if you allow me, I will show the six, uh, okay, I would like to show the uh, Armenian mirror spectator uh, if the, yes, uh, let me, <laughs> sorry, uh, the equipment is not co cooperating today. I wanted to show the audience the Armenian Mirror Spectator website where I read your six uh, thesis, and thank God this is possible now. What happened and why? It was a sort of a, to me personally, a somber and sobering assessment mere two weeks after the um, um, agreement to stop the war has been signed. And the reason I'm showing this is because not only because I read it with utmost interest, but because I wanted to ask you many questions on what you wrote at the time. First of all, has your thinking evolved? What are the, let's say, what are the trends between now and then? What is changing in Armenian public perception of the war and its aftermath? Where are things going, in your opinion? Will there be uh, another war? You write about uh, the threat of revenge and calls for revenge in the aftermath of the defeat. Um, I'm wondering, what is your feel right now? Well, I think what has uh, evolved since the end of the war is uh, 
basically some extent settling down, uh, recognizing the losses, uh, a lot of anger, a lot of uh, questions asked. Uh, I'm not confident that there was enough honest introspection on the part of um, leaders uh, of the past and the present political parties, uh, enough introspection to really have come to um, a conclusion as to what happened and why it happened. That is, uh, there are two levels of responsibility. One is the immediate responsibility, that is inability of the current government to avoid war and to get into serious negotiations. But in the background is the mentality uh, that uh, permitted that and in fact encouraged it. That is, we had uh, two kinds of thinking in Armenia. One was from the first administration, uh, the Der Bedrosian administration in which I served. And our conclusion at the time was that the victory, the first victory, uh, was not the end of the war, that this was one phase, that another was inevitable if there was no negotiated conclusion, a solution to the problem. And for that, there had to be mutual uh, concessions. And concessions meant serious concessions on both parts. Uh, on the other hand, there were those who thought uh, there, were, there was no need for concessions, that we would always win if there was a, another big round, uh, that um, time was on our side, while we were arguing time was not on our side. In some ways, it wasn't also on the side of Azerbaijan. That is, if Azerbaijan had to go to war, that means it also was bad, because a war means not only the enemy's uh, losses, but your own young men and your own uh, economy and resources. Uh, nonetheless, we thought time was not on our side. Uh, but others thought this was not a problem, that we could wait uh, and we could continue to become stronger. And there was therefore a conflict between what uh, was our realistic, what we call the realistic pragmatic world, uh, and versus the, the world of mostly illusions. Uh, the belief that uh, we were there uh, to, we, were, we would be able to keep everything we had when the whole world was telling us that it's not possible. Now, uh, that kind of mentality was supported uh, by the second administration, third administration, and the current administration. And the warnings that this would lead to war were not really taken seriously. And if there was war, yes, well, we would win. Uh, that was the idea. Now, uh, there are also nuances around this, but I will not get into that. So this, this is the big battle in Armenian political thinking that we went through uh, since 1994, the end of the first, uh, the first war and the ceasefire agreement signed in the summer. Uh, in May and then the summer of, of that year. Uh, the negotiating position of the subsequent governments had changed. Fundamentally, the decision was that if there was to be any return of the occupied territories, it would be in return for Azerbaijan's recognition of Garapa's independence, basically, or the right to self-determination which for Azerbaijan meant the same thing. And consequently, we, um, uh, this was something Azerbaijan would not accept, uh, and it was clear that it would not accept. Our solution was that we could leave the status for a subsequent uh, phase of negotiations, but we could and should return uh, uh, most of the occupied territories immediately in return for peace. And then we could work out uh, the, the second phase of negotiations. And that was not accepted. That was rejected. Uh, and uh, the policies that were followed after 98, when their Bedrosian was in fact forced to resign on that specific issue, uh, then uh, the policy changed. 
and uh, it led to kind of um, uh, magical thinking, uh, illusions, as I said, and uh, it led, uh, and they disregarded the signals that were coming and that were clearly there that the Azerbaijani army was changing, the uh, attitude was changing, and Azerbaijan would not wait forever uh, for a negotiated solution. Now, uh, of course, this is not to say that Azerbaijan was right, that uh, the self-determination didn't matter. Uh, I think Azerbaijan could have shown more flexibility. In uh, what way? Uh, in what way it, do you think it could have shown more flexibility? Well, I, I think it could have brought its own, uh, and this is a criticism for both, uh, since 98. It could have uh, both sides, you see, were relying on others to find solutions. And I've said this in Armenia, I've said this in Baku, uh, and I've said this in my articles. That is, both Azerbaijan, Armenia, and the Garapal leadership assumed that this was someone else's problem. Someone else had to bring solutions, and uh, we did not need um, uh, to do anything on our own. As if we were guests in the region. That is, the mediators brought coffee to you, uh, you were in their house, and Azerbaijan said, no, this is too sade, and the other one said, no, this is too sweet, bring us some other coffee, okay? So we wait for a year, for two years, for three years, and it's their problem to find solutions. Instead of saying, no, it's our problem, and we can uh, sit and talk to ourselves. Uh, my personal view is that mediators are useful, can be useful, uh, but there are different kinds of mediations. That is, um, a big question with regard to the Minsk group. Uh, the Minsk group ended up with the uh, tripartite co chairmanship Russia, France, the United States. My question, and what did they do? They brought, at different times, different texts, uh, detailed or uh, in print matters of principle, uh, Madrid principle and the principles and other principles and ask the, the parties to agree uh, and the parties would agree, disagree, but never at the end sign anything. Uh, and, uh, and that if it didn't work, then we can go home and wait for the next one. Um, but it is our problem. It was our problem. It's still our problem. And we uh, we need to find our own solutions and explore various possibilities. The, the issue of um, responsibility, there are two issues. One is the failure of negotiations. Who is responsible? I think all three parties are responsible for the failure of negotiations. But the second responsibility is for the Armenian side not to see that the power relations were changing. So it is not that Azerbaijan had the more right to, uh, to insist on its own solution. It was that it was getting stronger. And the Armenian side should have seen this. You write in your thesis, basically, that no matter what the um, situation was on the ground, it was pretty clear. I don't want to do injustice to your style by bastardizing or paraphrasing what you said. But what I understood your uh, article to say is that the war would have been disastrous for Armenia under any circumstances, and there shouldn't have been the encouragement of the war rhetoric, uh, be it on part of the government of Pashinyan or any other government. And when I find that quote, I will read it to you um, with pleasure. Uh, my question is... I'm sorry, Smiley, yes, please. I need to make a correction. Sure. Uh, I was not sure what would happen as a result of the war. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, wars are unpredictable. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I was quite sure that uh, the power relations had changed. I was quite sure that there would be no one to help Armenia. And I knew that Azerbaijan had uh, supporters that supported Azerbaijan unconditionally. 
under the circumstances, the possibility of loss was greater than possibility of, a, of another victory. So this was my position. And mm -hmm. secondly, the critique I made of the Armenian government is they, uh, our governments recently, they took chances with war rather than with peace mm -hmm. under the circumstances. So this is, uh, this is the position. I, no one can be sure of the result of a war, uh, but uh, uh, the possibility, the likelihood that the Armenian side would lose was more than uh, that Azerbaijan would lose again. Mm -hmm. uh, if I may read, uh, peace was treated at best as a choice that need not be valued more than war. It could be taken or rejected, and our rhetoric corresponded to that arrogance, and I might add, dangerously unwise judgment. Dr. Liberidian, I was trying to get to a sort of like a larger point. I'm very curious. On the one hand, what was the reaction to what you said in Armenia at the time? Again, two weeks on the 24th of November, um, two weeks after the war, the tensions ran high. I appreciate and understand that the people of Armenia were um, sort of um, maybe disoriented by the results of the war. Um, how did people um, react to what you said? Uh, was it uh, anger? Was it an invitation to um, sort of introspection? Uh, did you see the results of that? Did you influence the rhetoric? And also, if while you're answering, I, I understand I'm asking a long question. Um, if we look at a greater context, what is the ideological uh, sort of a context in Armenia right now, because for us, uh, looking from here or from Azerbaijan, sometimes it is very difficult to understand the ideological context of what's going on, and things don't take place in vacuum, right? Um, what sort of frameworks, how rigid are they? What can people in Armenia safely talk about right now, from where and to where, the degree of allowed discontent, shall we say. Can we talk about peace? Is it seen as defeatism? Is it seen as unpatriotic? If you could answer this question, like in right. a larger context, please. Okay. Now, uh, with regard to, to the first, that is the immediate reaction to my uh, analysis at the time, uh, it was two kinds of reactions. One was a good portion, of, I think, of the younger generation, uh, more open. Uh, they were very, um, I would say, uh, they felt good that what they thought was being expressed, or that there was a larger context to the loss that it wasn't just two guys fought in the street, but there's a history, there's a larger context in terms of uh, the political thinking. So it was accepted very, very positively, but by a good number, I cannot give percentages, but it was accepted because I know from the number of people who read, who wrote to me, uh, and, and I know that it was accepted very well by certain segments. However, the dominant political discourse uh, went against it. There was total unwillingness to accept responsibility, either in the execution of policy or in the larger thinking that uh, gave birth to the policy. That is, the uh, counting on illusions, the expectation, for example, particularly that uh, because Armenia is democratic now, the West will help for by some uh, formula for some reason, uh, that the patriotism of Armenians will suffice, uh, that uh, you know, underestimating Azerbaijan's uh, policies and capabilities and sentiments. So all of this, there was total denial of responsibility. And this is my concern, this is the concern. There, there is, uh, as I said, a large number of people who accept it. Until now, they ask for my articles, and I do a lot of interviews 
uh, with them, and I do a lot of uh, meetings with younger groups. But the dominant political groups, that is uh, the Pashinyan group, uh, individually, there are many individuals there who accept what I say, but the politics is to blame everyone else but oneself. Uh, the uh, the Sersaksian, uh, the group, the Republicans will not accept responsibility. The Kocharian team and himself, Kocharian, will not accept responsibility. Opposition groups that are supposed to oppose that were even more adamant on insisting what we call the not an inch back, you know, ideology that uh, uh, had started in the 1990s, late 90s, saying any territory that was taken with the blood of the soldier could not possibly re be returned by the diplomats. This was the thing. And so anyone who had advocated concessions uh, saying, yeah, we need to return the occupied territories in return for peace was called a traitor, just as I was. And that ideology that dominated has blocked them now from thinking that they had any kind of responsibility. Uh, in uh, in your uh, six thesis, you, you are referring to this uh, strategy of not give an inch back. Um, and you see it as a fundamental problem uh, with the way uh, the people think right now. In it, our fundamental problem is in the way you think. Uh, we think. I wanted to quote this part. Our problem is our political culture that relies on dreams rather than the hard facts. The way we strategize. Uh, let me show this on screen so people could read along as well. Um, if you give me a second. Uh, our problem is our political culture that relies on dreams rather than hard facts. The way we strategize, the way we easily set aside what the outside world and our antagonists say and do if these disturb any of our prejudices and predetermined beliefs. We adjust political strategy to our wishes, to what will make us feel good about ourselves rather than take into consideration the simple facts that collectively make up the reality around us. Our problem is the way we allow our judgment to be obscured by the highest, noblest, and ideal solutions of our problems, our illusions. Dr. Liberidian, in this context, um, I'm trying to think the predominant views within the Armenian ideological spectrum or discourse, the way you described it, you mentioned in passing that even you were called a traitor, the way the predominant thinking goes in Armenia today, is it compatible with the long-term peace with Azerbaijan? Um, I'm, I may take it a little like larger uh, and talk about reconciliation with Turkey. The way you look at it, you and I are both outside observers. Maybe we see things that people inside the region do not or are not willing to acknowledge. Is the dominant thinking, the mainstream thinking that is right now prevalent in Armenia compatible with long-term peace? Uh, the simple answer is um, uh, no, uh, it is not. Uh, I, and I'm not saying that uh, it's just those who are uh, revanchists who are talking about going back uh, to uh, rearming and uh, fighting again. And to, there, there's that segment. That's not the majority of Armenians. But there is uh, that, and they're very loud. Um, there is another segment that is ready to go and say, look, this is over. What, now we should really find a way to get along with our neighbors, Azerbaijan, Turkey. There's a good portion of the population, in my view, that is extremely upset, has still uh, not overcome the angry face of their sense that is against Azerbaijan, against Turkey that helped Azerbaijan, against Israel that helped Azerbaijan, against Russia that did not help Armenia, uh, against the West that did not help Armenia. That anger is still there. And that 
is, I don't know where it will go eventually, but uh, you have these three distinct uh, uh, groups within the population. I should add, however, uh, that my answer to long-term peace uh, should also include Azerbaijan's situation. That is, the Azerbaijani position, by and large, is not conducive to long-term peace today. Okay? Azerbaijan has not yet um, readjusted to the new world in a way that is necessary if Azerbaijan wants long-term peace. You cannot have long-term peace, is my, if you are insulting your neighbor, you defeat it constantly. If your rhetoric is one of hatred, if you have a victory park that has a racist attitude toward Armenians and Azerbaijani children are taken there to learn something. Does it? Um, I have not seen the park. I do not go to yeah. Azerbaijan. What yeah. what is so insulting about it? I I see the conversation on Facebook and on other social media. What is racist about the park? Well, it's the depiction of Armenian soldiers as mannequins, as ugly uh, and uh, and humiliated uh, soldiers. And you don't do this in war, in defeat or in victory. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the the message is that Armenians are ugly, Armenians are worth uh, killing, and Armenians uh, cannot think. There's nothing there that leads anyone to think. But also uh, uh, to, for example, the president's statement three days ago, four days ago, that our, see Armenians, they can't even defend their borders, okay? We're Which talking about the Azerbaijani president, Ilham Aliyev's yes, statements. Yes, okay. yes. Mr. Aliyev, said something like that. Now that means that you went to the border, okay, you violated the border, and Armenians can't defend it, so you advanced. You see, th this is not conducive to long-term peace. You see, you can win the war, you can impose your will, but there is not peace. There is the absence of war, mm -hmm. because that generates, particularly in the situation Armenians are now, that generates anger, frustration, and the channeling of uh, the sense toward, uh, see, saying the enemy is bad, right? So it's bad. We were defeated, but it's bad. We can't talk to them. This is the end result of that kind of rhetoric. So if we're going to discuss long-term peace, we have to see whether Azerbaijan is behaving like a conquering army force that doesn't have to respect any uh, Armenian, not just feelings, but also interests. If I conquered, I won, therefore I can do and say anything I want. I do not have the conviction that the result will be long-term peace, even with the best of intentions on the Armenian side. This, yeah. Uh, Dr. Liberadian, I just wanted to ask you, I understand the events you're referring to, I understand the context of the statements you're referring to. If we may compare and contrast the way Azerbaijan is acting now, having, uh, let's say, won the second war, with the way Armenia conducted itself for um, uh, a number of decades, having won the first war, do you think that the reaction and the behavior of Azerbaijan now goes much far beyond uh, what Armenia was doing during the 30 year preceding to the, after the 90s, after the uh, victory in the first war? Do you think that it is not a mirror sort of reaction? I'm kind of curious. Uh, two kinds of answers. Mm -hmm. First of all, it is not the mirror. There was no racism in Armenian rhetoric. There was disdain, but there was no racism as there was in the Azerbaijani rhetoric. So uh, it is not a mirror image. Mm -hmm. Armenians did other things, mm -hmm. uh, like the destruction in, in the, uh, of property in, in the occupied areas, uh, but there was not that kind of racism which I saw in Azerbaijani textbooks and on Azerbaijani television. Mm -hmm. 
There was nothing like that in, in Armenia, number one. But number two, look at the result of what Armenians did, okay? Whatever it is they did, whether it's a mirror or not, it created the kind of anger in Azerbaijan that did not lead to peace, but it led to war. Now, if Azerbaijan, you're explaining, you're providing a possible explanation, which is important as to why Azerbaijan is doing. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't point it out. It doesn't mean that it gave bad results when Armenians were on this side, the victors, and Azerbaijan had lost. And now to do the same is fine, it's understandable, but then we shouldn't talk about peace. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't talk mm -hmm. about long-term peace, okay? Mm -hmm. if, we, if we talk about long-term peace, there's also another dimension to this. Mm -hmm. The way Azerbaijan talks, and Turkey also, is that, look, the problem of Garapal was that Armenians had occupied our lands. OK. Uh, and we took it back. And now the problem is resolved. OK. This is part of the Azerbaijani rhetoric. Well, if you think that is the case, then you are saying none of your interests, Armenia and Garapag Armenians, none of them matter. OK. You don't matter because the problem is still what happens to Armenians in Azerbaijan, in Garapa? okay? What happens to the borders? But there's still issues to be decided. And Armenians have an interest in that. And if your position is the problem is resolved, then my problems, the problems I see, are not being recognized by you. And as long as my problems are not being recognized by you and dealt with, one way or another, hopefully through negotiations, then there cannot be peace. There can be absence of war, but absence of war is not peace. Mm -hmm. So if Azerbaijan doesn't want peace, then uh, it can do, it can continue doing and saying whatever it is. But if it wants peace, then it has to realize that there are some issues that are of interest and could be negotiated, could be discussed, that are very important to Armenians. Just because you won the war doesn't mean that you do not, uh, that the other's interests are lost. And this was something I pointed out and others like me pointed out before the second war. We pointed out saying, look, Azerbaijan has interests there, mm -hmm. okay? And those interests uh, do not go because there were, there were people who were saying, the Garapak problem is resolved, okay? What is left is Azerbaijan's problem. Let them go and deal with it. And mm -hmm. our point was, it is not resolved because Azerbaijan has interests that have not been resolved. And we need to sit and discuss how can we recognize those interests. Mm -hmm. And this is my position. My critique of the Armenian position or the dominant position is now the critique of the Azerbaijani position. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking that this is a temporary situation that Azerbaijan, uh, I believe the Azerbaijani people want peace. I also believe President Aliyev wants peace. But in order to do that, there have to be some changes in the attitude, in the rhetoric, in the actions. I understand, Dr. Liberidian, I cannot speak to the Armenian textbooks or the Armenian television, to be honest, simply because I do not understand the language. Um, but um, if I may share my personal experiences on social media of interacting with Armenians, you say there was no racism, and um, honestly, my personal experience has been quite different. I've heard things that I don't care to repeat on the air, but I'm one of them— I, excuse me, from presidents? Please. No. From, uh, this, well, this is the difference. Okay. Political okay. parties, social media can say what they want, uh -huh. but no uh -huh. Armenian president or prime minister mm -hmm. has used that kind of language. Uh, did uh, did uh, Robert Kocharyan, if I'm not mistaken, not say that Armenians and Azerbaijanis are biologically incompatible? Would that? Yes. 
Yes, would that not that, be uh, an example of that that's rhetoric? That's racism toward Armenians too. Mm -hmm. okay? Uh huh. Okay. That's racism toward Armenians as well. It's an insult to both peoples. Okay. In okay. my view, it's not just toward Azerbaijan. It's a, an insult toward Armenians. When you heard that, what did you feel? What does it even mean? Oh, I, I thought uh, the man is uh, not just an ignoramus, uh, but also he uh, he does not have a thinking process. He does not have an education that is a, a, an education. I, I still think the same thing, and I've written the same uh, about uh, Kocharyan. I, I think he, he went... Uh, uh, I don't think he has a sense of people, you know? He has a sense of uh, people in the sense that you respect people, you respect your own people. I don't think he respects the Armenian people. I don't think he respects the Azerbaijani or the Turkish people. For him, all peoples are, uh, are tools to achieve uh, this or that goal. So uh, I, I agree that that statement was. Uh, absolutely unacceptable, but it was, I thought, insulted myself, you know, um, because I have many Azerbaijani friends. If they were my neighbors, I could live with them. So why is he talking about me mm -hmm. that way and my family and my friends and my relatives and my people? It's an insulting statement. But when a politician makes mm -hmm. such kind of a statement, I believe he or she expects um, a receptive audience because politicians don't like saying unpopular things. And again, I'm coming back to this question. What part of the Armenian populace, what part of the Armenian society is receptive to incendiary statements or like, like the one that we were discussing? Uh, yes, that's a very good question. I cannot be... You know, uh, honest, if I said it's 10%, 30%, 40%, uh, it's not. There is a segment. I could say that there are some political parties, particularly one, uh, whose ideology is based on hatred of Azerbaijanis and Turks. That is, we will never be friends. They are genocidal peoples, right? This is... Uh, so... Uh, are we talking about Dashnak Tsutsun? I'm sorry, many people... Exactly. For example, yes, okay. for example, okay. Okay. That is, okay. there's a whole ideology that uh, these are eternal enemies, right? Okay. So, but that's limited. What percentage of votes did they get, the Tashin Aksun, in Armenia? Mm -hmm. Never above 10%. Okay. Usually around 4 or 5%. Once they got 8% in parliamentary elections, and they there was a... <laughs> they played with the numbers to give them 11% so they could get a couple of more members of parliament. But that's it. It has usually been around 4 to 5%. So the Tashin Aksun has that attitude, but it doesn't get more than 5%, 10%. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. most of the people do get, uh, do, uh, do not accept that kind of, I mean, they do think they fear Turkey, okay? Mm -hmm. But they fear mm -hmm. Turkey, uh, but that's not the same as what the Tashin Aksun is saying. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in other words, please help me understand. Uh, when the, uh, when you say that Tashin Aksun gets about 4 or 5%, let's say 10%, so their ideological grip on the uh, society of Armenia is um, lopsided. Is it more than the number of votes or percentage of votes they get? Is that what, I, what I'm understanding? That's yeah, I, I understand. That's a good question. They are very loud. Okay. Okay. They have media. They have a TV right. station. They have newspapers. And they talk a lot. And they demonstrate a lot. So their noise is louder than what they uh, represent. Mm -hmm. I could say that their, their position is more accepted in the diaspora. But even that has become less and less. Mm -hmm. Okay. Diaspora here or in Russia, or does it make uh, any difference? In, in, in uh, uh, you know, there are variations. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of degrees, right? Uh, uh, it's a matter of degrees because the diasporas, particularly in the West and in the Middle East, are formed by the survivors of the genocide. 
So the memory uh, goes from generation to generation, and but in Armenia, uh, it, it's a different political process. Now, uh, there too, there are many who are the children and grandchildren of survivors, but still, it is not the same political process because the difference is this: in Armenia, whether you have good relations with Turkey or not, with Azerbaijan or not, is a matter of life and death. In the diaspora, it isn't. This is the difference. So in the diaspora, you can believe whatever you want. You can hate. You can be in love with France. Uh, we, you can uh, be the eternal enemy of Turkey. It will make no difference to your life. In Armenia, it, it is a matter of life or death whether you get along with your neighbors or not. Uh, Dr. Liberidian, thank you for this. I was actually going to share my personal experience for a couple of seconds. Sure. I have become the um, example of how life in a diaspora makes a person more intransigent, less willing to compromise, and less willing to understand the idea, uh, the situation on the ground, um, less willing to search for peace. I do soul searching publicly quite often on Facebook. And one day I woke up and I realized that living away from home, away from Azerbaijan, made me more warlike than I ever thought I would be. In this context, um, may we speak about the influence of the diaspora, Armenian diaspora, on the situation in Armenia, and I'm not, I understand that there are shades of gray that a diaspora in the United States is different maybe from the diaspora in France, uh, which is different from the diaspora in Russia or Lebanon. Um, may we talk about the influence that the diaspora wields on the uh, situation in, uh, in the region, on the people in the region, on the people in Armenia? So the, is Armenian population nudged by the diaspora towards the war, even if it would like to avoid it at times? Is it fair to say? Well, um, it is certainly fair to ask the question, and it is certainly fair to have the impression that that is so. But at the end, I do not think that decisions made in Yerevan are made by the diaspora, number one. I do not think that uh, the fundamental directions of governments in Armenia have ever been uh, because of the diaspora. Now, the diaspora has been part of the political thinking, and, uh, uh, and in a couple of ways. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. the main way is uh, in the uh, Kocharian uh, world, when Kocharian and Vasken Sarkisyan, at the time the defense minister was later assassinated, and Serge Sarkisyan, who later became third president, when these three uh, came together to force their Bedrosian to resign, what was their argument? Uh, to their Bedrosian's argument that we are now still strong and this is the time to sign a treaty. Okay? That was the uh, Der Bedrosian logic. You do not sign a treaty when you are weak. You sign when you are strong. You take into consideration the other's interest, and therefore you get to peace. Now, the argument was that we do not need to make concessions now. We will see about later. But uh, there Bedrosan's argument that, look, at least financially, we will never be able to compete with Azerbaijan. What was the Kocharian response? Well, Azerbaijan has oil and we have the diaspora. Uh -huh. Okay. It wasn't the diaspora that was saying, I am equal to the oil that Azerbaijan will sell, but it was Kocharyan and uh, supported by the Tashnak student that the diaspora can and will provide equal amount invest of investments in Armenia if we do the right thing, that is no concessions, and if we make genocide recognition the, the basis of Armenia's foreign policy toward Turkey. This is very critical. So they said, we are not getting the money 
the investments because of Der Bedrosian's two policies on genocide and uh, concessions to Azerbaijan. Mm -hmm. So it figured in the configuration that Kocharyan had, his calculations, that no, we will not be weaker than Azerbaijan. We will not have less money than Azerbaijan. We, because we have the diaspora. So you are assigning a role to the diaspora, which by and large the diaspora would not accept. Now, nothing like what they expected happened when Der Bodrosian resigned. Kocharyan came as president. He started talking about the genocide and he started talking about, you know, basically no concessions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nothing like that happened. Mm -hmm. But it did not matter. They continued to bring in the diaspora factor. And the diaspora can deliver on certain things, mm -hmm. but it cannot match. But mm -hmm. so the, the answer is that the diaspora figures out in the thinking of some elements in Armenia, uh, but others are much more realistic about the diaspora. That has been very helpful, but it is not the same thing as having uh, the oil and gas plus Turkey on your side plus Israel on your side, plus Pakistan on your side, and, and Russia not on your side. You well, I, I, <laughs> Pakistan being on Azerbaijani's side is a quite questionable proposition. I'm, I'm sure there has been some yeah. rhetoric. but Ukraine, Ukraine sells arms to Azerbaijan. There's diplomatic support. It's not just military support coming to fight with you. I'm talking about unconditional diplomatic support and some ways armed support that Azerbaijan has because it has money, it can buy, but uh, Armenia does not. But I'm sorry, but Russia supplies arms for free to Armenia. I mean, this it's, is a well-known fact, uh, isn't it? Of course, I don't know that it's free. I don't know that it's free. Okay. It costs Armenia and it costs much more than money. It what does it cost? Does it cost sovereignty, do you think? Or what does it cost? Uh, what was your question? I'm does sorry? it cost sovereignty to Armenia? What does so it cost? Yes, of course. Of course it does. Everything you sell to, uh, to you buy from Russia, you sell to Russia, uh, costs uh, your sovereignty. Of course it does. Are you concerned for the future sovereignty and independence of Armenia if uh, the yes. current trends... Could you yes. elaborate, please? Well, uh, look... Um, Russia uh, had the border with Turkey. Now it will have the border with Iran, and it will have the border with uh, Azerbaijan, the Azerbaijan's west, Armenia's east, right? The peacekeepers are there, number one. Number two, you are um, looking at more dependence on Russia because of the... Um, mediation of Russia and the November 9 ceasefire statement and uh, Russia being uh, the, uh, the decider as to what the November 9 statement means and Russia having Lachin corridor and Lacha will have the Russia will have uh, whatever transport whatever it is called between uh, southwest Azerbaijan and Nakhchevan so uh, there are these issues, and um, uh, so the dependence uh, has increased. Armenia does not have the funds to buy arms, much arms, from anywhere else. So arms-wise, you depend uh, on that. And uh, uh, so I, I see that uh, the war uh, with Russian mediation, ending with Russian mediation, and now Russia... In taking charge of uh, whatever is left of Garapa, nagorno garapa right? Russia is there. It's Russia's decision, plus, of course, Azerbaijan's decision. Armenia's input in what happens to Garapa is much less now than it was before the war. And Russia's say-so has increased. So uh, to the extent that uh, Garapa is still a problem for Armenia, a problem uh, that has many sides to be resolved, it's no longer in Armenia's hands. The future of the Armenian population of Artsakh is less in Armenia's hands and more 
to begin with Azerbaijan and then Russia. Dr. Liberidian, would it would I be very unfair um, to say that it was ultimately Armenia's behavior and Armenia's position that brought Russians um, both to Armenia and to Karabakh, which, as you say, it now rules and operates. Would, 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 would that be a very unfair statement, do you You're think? Talking about today? I'm talking about, you know, as a historic context. I mean, we can look at as far back okay. as 30 years ago. Uh, no, I, I think it would be also Turkey's responsibility that refused to have normal relations mm -hmm. and decreased the fears in Armenia mm -hmm. of Turkey. So mm -hmm. we have uh, more than uh, Russia that is responsible. If Tar I was at the time negotiator with Turkey, uh -huh. you know, uh, and we had an... Uh, uh, the negotiations are started in uh, summer of 92, and by uh, February of 93, we were very close to having normal relations, normalizing relations, a protocol to normalize relations and open the border. But uh, Turkey uh, then linked it to Azerbaijan, and Azerbaijan pushed Turkey toward uh, non-support, non-opening of the border. Mm -hmm. So indirectly Azerbaijan, directly Turkey, refused to have normal relations. And you you have a huge number uh, uh, neighbor mm -hmm. who refuses mm -hmm. to open the border, who refuses to have normal relations where you could resolve all differences, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that, and coming from uh, the, uh, the genocide issue, then the fear of Armenians was real. To mm -hmm. what extent that fear was justified? Uh, to some extent, it was because there was a, you know, one president of us of uh, Turkey did threaten Armenia. So uh, the reason why Armenians became closer to Russia and invited more of Russia mm -hmm. was also uh, Turkey. Uh -huh. the, otherwise, uh -huh. Armenia was not concerned about uh, other fears. So there was as much love for sovereignty and independence uh, than as anywhere else. But to your knowledge, did Russia ever try to sort of derail the rapprochement, the possible rapprochement between Armenia and Turkey? Was Russia going to stand by and watch Armenia sort of normalize relations with Turkey, open its borders? Was Russia an impediment to that process at any point that you're aware of? Uh, you know, uh, it's a difficult question to answer. At one level, I can say no, okay. because when in 2009, under uh, President Sersaksyan, there were the Zurich, two protocols of Zurich, which did exactly that, right? Uh, they allowed, uh, they uh, provided for the establishment of normal relations, diplomatic, and the opening of the border, and Russia was a sponsor of that. Uh, Foreign Minister of Russia Lavrov was standing right behind there with uh, Hillary Clinton, the Secretary of State of the U.S. So Russia formally and diplomatically did not constitute an obstacle when uh, that happened. Uh, but other than that, whether it was in Russia's interest and if it was not, did Russia do anything? Uh, you know, Russia is one country that understands the South Caucasus more than anyone else, okay? Because it has basically ruled that place for 200 years or so. Okay. So okay. Uh, Russian policies are pursued in a number of ways. Uh, there's public diplomacy, but there's also ways by which they can impact Armenian thinking. And that is more indirect. And that has happened too. Uh, I don't know if, as a, uh, if Russia pursued a distinct but uh, silent policy of doing that or not. Okay. Uh, okay. But I know that publicly uh, they did not oppose normalization of relations. When I, I know that when I was negotiating, they were very interested as to what would happen. 
and uh, as were other countries, whether the negotiations were being were progressing enough and was uh, there was positive thought or not, they were very interested. But I did not feel that they were making it impossible for me to negotiate or for Armenia. Mm -hmm. Now, what else they did, if they did anything else, I, I cannot, uh, I do not know. Since we're on the topic of Russia, if I may, very quickly, uh, I'm trying to be mindful of your time and my questions are growing longer and longer. <laughs> Sorry. Um, when it comes to Russia, um, you as a historian are able to sort of like rise to the bird's eye view level and look at the region, not only from the Armenian perspective, but also from Azerbaijani and Georgian and maybe Turkish and Iranian. In general, what I'm trying to ask is Russia's foothold now also in Azerbaijan, um, does it pose any long-term strategic stability threats to the entire region? Is it a good thing or is it a bad thing in your, in your view? Is it a good thing for the future of in the three independent South Caucasus states? Um, let me say this. Uh, it is difficult to say how things will evolve in the South Caucasus. Uh, I could answer in, in partially by saying I did not find it it was useful to have a mini Cold War in the South Caucasus between the Western influence and the Russian influence. Okay, that I found very damaging uh, because that is as, as harmful to sovereignty and a rational decision making on the part of the three republics as any one country dominating. My view of the long-term uh, interests, sovereignty interests and security of the region is more uh, like the three major powers around um, the South Caucasus um, agreeing to these three republics working together, resolve their problems, and develop more of a regional approach where the influence of others is less, but a region that takes into consideration Russian interests, Turkish interests, Iranian interests, but above all their own interests. Now, for that, you need to be left alone a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a question here, the responsibility of uh, the U.S. and NATO, the way they behaved after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, they behaved in a way that made Russians fearful. The advance of NATO all the way to Russian borders, which ru they had agreed not to. And Russia felt surrounded. It's being surrounded. And then there was the push to... Uh, turn the South Caucasus into NATO allies. Mm -hmm. And this I would not accept if I was Russia, you know, and Iran would not accept. Uh, and so uh, I did, I find that the Russian drive to have more influence is as much to keep the West out, NATO out, and American influence that sets the countries against Russia as much as to extend their own. Russia has legitimate interests in the South Caucasus. So does Iran. Iran does not, would not like to have Americans uh, dominate the South Caucasus mm -hmm. because they have all the sanctions and they want to make war. You know, they were very close a couple of times to make war against Iran. So uh, there are interests. So I would say that if the three republics were able to come together, and mm -hmm. I think I've done this study on, on foreign policy issues for the three republics. And if you take out the Garapal issue, 90% of their policies with minor uh, 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 nuances would be the same. And, and no, it would not be against any country, any neighbor, any interest, but it would, have, it would come closer to its own identity and thus comfort Russia saying, you know, we're not selling to anyone else. And, and Turkey would feel comfortable and everyone would feel uh, more protected. Mm -hmm. So I would say to understand Russia, we need to understand also Western behavior 
uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And I think what happened is both in Russia and the U.S., particularly to some extent uh, Europe, NATO, NATOized Europe, uh, what happened is that there were segments of the dominant elites in both countries, in both parts that were not satisfied with the result of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Okay? That is, Americans, some American, this is the part of the elite, not the whole elite. Mm -hmm. In Europe, they wanted to make Russia very weak and make it incapable of coming back as a power. To kick it when it's down, so to speak. Right. To kick it and keep it down, make sure it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And Eastern mm -hmm. European countries helped with that, saying, we're afraid, let's keep Russia down. Mm -hmm. And now they have their own thinking, but this encouraged the uh, some of the elite in Russia under Yeltsin being dissatisfied with, the, with Yeltsin's opening to the West, saying, we do not trust them, see what they're doing. So they took steps that encouraged the hardliners in the U.S., and the U.S. hardliners took steps that encouraged the hardliners in Russia. And this led to the Putin phenomenon that said, enough is enough. We have our dignity. We're a big nation. We're a powerful nation. And we need to reoccupy the place we had. So this is a process that cannot, I don't think, can be denied. So you say uh, the hoax in the West sort of uh, inspired the nationalist uh, populist movement in, in Russia, and uh, right. uh, that was... Right. Uh, Dr. Liberidian, knowing history, knowing past, uh, sort of like puts you in a good position to talk about the future. I'm very curious about your views um, about uh, the U.S. and what the Russian propaganda calls the collective West and its policy towards uh, our region, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia. We, those people living in the region think that it's the most important region in the world and the, you know, the global crossroads, you know, we have a number of cliches. I'm very curious as to how you see, did the United States learn from exactly what you were just describing? Did Europe learn from that? Uh, what, uh, what sort of like in the list of priorities for both U.S. and Europe, what sort of like... Um, line is Nagorno-Karabakh or South Caucasus in general, would you say? Well, for the West, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh is, uh, is certainly not a priority. Uh, neither is the whole region. It's not a priority. Uh, you see, internationally, what we have seen is the decreasing influence of uh, the West in the South Caucasus. Uh, I, I do not have any doubt about that. And I've been saying this the last about 10 years, even before Trump came, right? So uh, I, I think uh, that influence has become less. Although every year, once or twice, U.S. high officials will visit the region and say, you are very important to us. But uh, I don't think that's true anymore. The fact is that this last war and this last uh, ceasefire agreement was signed by Russia and the parties, no Minsk group, plus uh, Turkey's involvement. That is, uh, since in the last 10 years or so, there's a natural decrease in the influence of the West and the U.S. specifically, and the rise of regional powers that act on their own, such as Russia, such as Turkey, such as Israel, uh, so there are regional powers that are acting independently from the U.S. So uh, what we have is uh, the scheme that was thought in the 1990s, uh, the best mind being uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski at the time, who said, uh, okay, the Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore. What is the purpose of American foreign policy? He said that in 20 or 30 years, we will not be the only superpower. China will be up there. 
Russia may come back. There could be others, India, right? Uh, so the world will not be the world of the 1990s. Now, we have a window of opportunity as the U.S. to do certain things which we will not be able to do at that time. And what were those things? He said, we need to resolve the hot spots and encourage democratic liberal uh, governments and thus decrease the tensions and decrease the area where we would be in conflict with others and maximize our soft power rather than hard power. Mm -hmm. So this was mm -hmm. his idea. But that meant getting along with the others. And that's not what happened. So the Cold War collapsed. I mean, because there was no side left, the communist side, so to speak. The uh, hegemonic US world was not going to last and did not last. But we the do Pax not Americana. Have, um, yeah, but we do not have any new world order. This is where we are. I would really love to talk to you about the global issues because because what I find what you're saying is fascinating uh, as fascinating. Uh, but our uh, viewer uh, is returning us to um, uh, the problems in the region. If I may read you a portion of a question, please. Uh, An uh, Araz Garaev is asking, is it possible in the future to accept Azerbaijani and Kurdish origin ex-Armenian citizens back? I am one of them. And I, uh, I'm absolutely asking this question uh, with serious intentions, no propaganda. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm reading the question as it is written. So I believe the question is, is that even part of a discourse? Is that even part of a conversation? Or maybe when you served in the Armenian government, uh, was that even part of um, you know consideration of returning former uh, Armenian citizens of Azerbaijani, or as a gentleman writes, Kurdish origin, back to Armenia? Was it ever discussed resettling them back in the homes from which they were forced to leave? Well. Uh... Uh, it's an interesting question, an important one, uh, but I don't think that it came up. That is, the Garapal issue was so much, so dominant. The issues surrounding Garapal Armenians, Garapal Azeris, their return uh, was such, and the expulsion of non-Armenians uh, although Armenian citizens from Armenia being accompanied by uh, non-Azeri Armenian citizens of Azerbaijan, about 350,000 of them, and about, uh, I don't know, 100 and some thousand, 180,000 maybe uh, from Armenia. This larger issue was not, I can say, at the forefront. Now, I think if we are able to find a way for uh, things to settle down, real peace to begin taking hold, then it may be possible to say, you know, uh, anyone who wants to come back should come back and uh, in, in both places. Now, whether that's realistic or not, are we talking about hundreds, thousands? Are we talking about everyone? I don't know. I know that in negotiations there was always this question for example, Azerbaijan would insist on saying uh, Azeri residents of Garapal shall return mm -hmm. to Garapal. Mm -hmm. There were about, uh, what, 40,000, I think, who were expelled from the autonomous region of nagorno garapal right? 40,000 Azeris. I, I, I would not be able to speak to the statistics. Yeah, that's about, yeah, that's about the number, 40,000 uh, Azeri uh, versus, uh, you know, I'm not talking about the occupied uh, districts. I'm talking about strictly Azerbaijan, uh, I, I mean, uh, Garapal. Okay. And we would say, listen, that is normal, but you cannot say shall return, which says everyone will have to return. Are you going to force them? Some of them left, just as, you know, uh, Armenians cannot, shall not return anywhere where they're no longer. That is, we'll have the capacity, we'll have the right, 
and we'll have the right to security. Mm -hmm. But it, the wording is different. So if today uh, the border was open, the Armenian government or some government in five, ten years said, look, those of you who are expelled, you have the right to return. And we guarantee your security. Uh, that's a different thing than saying they shall. So if that is open, then what are we talking about? Maybe, you know, sometimes it is um, the numbers issue. That is, if you say, I'm just giving as an example, a hundred of them are returning, I don't think anyone would care. Mm -hmm. If you say a thousand are returning, some people may care. If you say 100,000 are returning, then people will say, you know, we're changing the demography that has been created. Similarly with Azerbaijan, if a thousand Armenians want to return to Baku or Ganja or whatever, you know, that may not m mean anything. But if 200,000 Armenians would return to Baku, I don't know what Azerbaijan would say. Well, the population is about four, four million. I don't think Azerbaijan would be very threatened by that, but I cannot speak neither well, for the government nor the people. No, it's, it's difficult to say. That's, yes, that's I understand my, your yeah. point. I understand your point. Uh, my greater concern here is um, when we're talking about a return of the population, like let's look at uh, the world through the eyes of uh, the Armenian uh, community in Karabakh. Uh, okay, right now there are Russian troops. Do you see a future where Ar ethnic Armenian uh, ethnic Armenians in Karabakh will be able to accept living on the Azerbaijani territory, that they're living in Azerbaijan, and will they ever feel safe? And this question I'm asking, uh, I understand I'm cognizant of the fact that you live in the United States just like I do, but maybe you have an insight. Is there a possibility for the future that these people who de jure, whom de jure Azerbaijan considers its own citizens, um, and says so quite openly, just like it does, I believe, in the case of Robert Kocharyan as well. Um, will they ever feel safe uh, living inside Azerbaijan and being ruled by the Azerbaijani laws and the constitution and uh, seek protection from the Azerbaijani police, etc.? Is that sci-fi territory we're entering now? Well, uh, that's that's a question that needs to be addressed, but at this point cannot be answered in my view. I can answer in one way, okay. that okay. it's what does the current leadership think mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the Armenians in Karabakh? Mm -hmm. They have specifically said that they will never feel safe under Azerbaijani sovereignty. Mm -hmm. This is what they've said. Okay. So okay. I know that. I have not been to Garapal for a long time. I understand. And certainly not there now after the war as to what they feel now that someone else may be able to answer. But I can say what is the official statement on that subject, that they regard the Azerbaijani government as racist, that it is part of the Azerbaijani culture and politics, uh, the policies of the government uh, to be anti-Armenian, and Armenians can never feel safe in, uh, in, uh, in an Azerbaijan without the Russians. This is what they say. Mm -hmm. Now, this can change or not, uh, I do not know. I understand. Uh, Dr. Liberati, and we touched upon, I understand you're getting tired. I, I kept you on the air. Um, but there are a couple of things I have to ask you. Um, it's not we, just I'm getting tired. At some point, my I it's my turn to take care of my grandson. Oh, I see. <laughs> I, I see. I will try to keep you as short as possible, but you're a rare guest, and there are questions I want to address to you. So please bear with me for a couple of minutes. Um you talked about, we talked about the U.S. policy. We talked about the recognition of genocide. Uh, we talked about it being a, sort of like a cornerstone, something that the political elite, or at least part of it, were betting on. So now the U.S. president uttered those words and uh, effectively recognized the uh, Armenian genocide as a fact. What does that change uh, in the grand scheme of things? If we sort of like 
take a step back from the emotional charge of it. And if we looked at the legal or maybe even political implications for the entire region, what does the fact that Biden said uh, whatever he said, I cannot quote him right now from the top of my mem- uh, top of my head. Um, what does it change on the ground, really? Does it move us forward in solving some issues? Does it sort of like inflame passions even more? What does it do, help or harm? Well, it depends on who you are talking about. Uh, my simple answer is that as far as our region is concerned, uh, it doesn't change much. It has no practical impact. As far as the diaspora is concerned, it has no practical impact, except psychologically, uh, a good number of Armenians are satisfied. They feel more comfortable. They feel that the, the memory of, of the, their grandparents, great-grandparents, etc., are being respected. Their history is being respected. So it's more psychological. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to the politics, it's... Um, the, there are two issues left with regard to the genocide. One is uh, the, those for whom the political parties or lobbying groups for whom genocide is the number one item on the agenda, Turkey's recognition comes next. So mm-hmm. uh, they, they say, okay, this was one more step, a very important step. Now the battle continues. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, so this is one. And this will find resonance in a number of circles in the Armenian diaspora and uh, possibly Armenia. Uh, It has, again, no practical consequence, but uh, it will not stop the, the issue. The second question is that for those same groups, some of those groups, uh, like the Tashnags and other Armenian political parties, Mm -hmm. The genocide is seen as the foundation on which you start making your demands for compensation. Okay? That is uh, Turkey's recognition, and then comes the pat- The battle continues. Uh, you need compensation. Uh, you need financial compensation for all the properties that were lost. You need, I mean, these issues will come. And up to uh, you know the uh, territories, there are groups that demand that what Armenians call Western Armenia, mm-hmm. what is Eastern mm-hmm. Turkey, be returned to Armenia. So, I mean, I'm not ta- asking you to stretch your imagination on any specific or any plausible scenarios or strategies. I'm saying that remains on the agenda of the mostly diaspora. In Armenia, there will be some who will believe in this, but no Armenian government has made any territorial demands from Turkey, Mm -hmm. uh, except that in the last uh, last summer, on the 100th anniversary of the Treaty of Sevres, which in principle allotted eastern Uh, Turkish territories to Armenia, to the First Republic, uh, they said it's an important treaty. I've written about that separately, of course, Uh, but uh, it's not something we're talking about that is real, but it is enervating to Turkey. I understand. If we had more time, I would ask you if that would be akin to, uh, let's say, Jews or, or Israel demanding, making territorial claims of the Pale of Settlement, what they call, you know, parts of uh, Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus, and Poland, uh, or even Germany. But um, that would be a topic for another conversation. I I want to let you go as soon as I can so you could take care of your grandson. Please let me finish with uh, your last um, uh, uh, thesis, which stuck with me. Um, let me show it to the readers. Maybe they can read along better than I can uh, bo- uh, butcher it. What have we today in the mar- it, in the marketplace of strategic thinking as far as the government and the opposition that wants to replace it is extremely worrisome and dangerous. We see the continuing refusal to look at the real questions and the self-evident answers and repeat the same slogans 
cling to the same illusions. We're offering the wrong solution to the wrong diagnosis. Dr. Liberidian, uh, the uh, elections in Armenia are coming soon. And I believe that uh, this question is poignant in the context of the upcoming elections. What the government is, uh, the ruling party is doing, what uh, Pashinyan is thinking, what the opposition is thinking. And if you answering this question, if you could also uh, uh, discuss the behavior of, um, uh, as you alluded earlier, uh, the behavior of the Azerbaijani president and his statements, do they factor in in the domestic, uh, let's say, agenda of Armenia right now? Is it seen as a galvanizing uh, sort of impact? Is it bringing a ban? I don't know how to how to say this. Is it bringing nationalists together? Is it influencing the domestic situation? So, what sort of soul searching is the opposition going through right now, and what is the impact of uh, what Azerbaijan is saying or its president is saying on the elections in Armenia? Would you say? Well, uh, again, a two pronged answer. Uh, Briefly, one answer is that uh, I still do not see a serious, in-depth analysis and uh, discussion, public discussion, uh, because of the denial on all parts that they are responsible. If you're not responsible, then nothing went wrong, right? Except the other guy. So that it's not happening yet. I don't know if it will happen in the future. Now, uh, the other answer, the, the answer to your other question, the behavior and the rhetoric from Azerbaijan impacting? Absolutely. It is, you, you use the right word, it is galvanizing the opposition to say Pashinyan is weak, he cannot do this, he cannot do that, and he lost, he's the guy who lost, he, he's responsible for everything. And uh, that is uh, helping, uh, I would say, uh, some, I don't know again what percentage, to support, let's say, people, uh, a person like Kocharya, who represents himself as the strong guy. Now, Kocharyan has not said what he will do and what he will not do. Pashinyan has not said what he will do and what. No one has defined what are the challenges today and what are their solutions. That's not happening. So it's just very vague terminologies. I do think that Pashinyan has come to realize that he has to be more realistic with regard to the November 9th statement, mm -hmm. but no one else, and he is not dealing with it very honestly and openly, saying, these are the issues that we are facing, this is my solution, this is the reason for my solution, mm -hmm. and certainly hardly anyone else is doing that, partly because it's not clear what will happen. You know, for example, what does the Russian presence in Garapa mean? What are the Russian intentions? Uh, the, the only uh, honest group there is their Bedrosian's party, the Armenian Congress. They are the only ones who are honestly talking about what is there and uh, the need to change mentality and the inability of Pashinyan, they're arguing, to really be the leader to negotiate on behalf of Armenia having been subjected to the disaster that his policies led to. So uh, I would say there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of uh, vague discussions. Some saying we will go back and take everything back. How and, you know, why? Uh, that's not clear. So I would say there's more uncertainty and more vagueness than any time I've known Armenia in the last 30 years. Uh Dr. Liberidian, um, I have a million questions, but it was a great honor to speak to you. And um, I hope in the future you may find time for us again and for our audience. Uh, on behalf of those who were watching us and myself personally, let me uh, thank you once more for your time today. I, I know you have to take care of your uh, grandson, so we will let you go. Thank you very much. That's number one item on my personal agenda. <laughs> well, that's a very good uh, number one item to have. Hope to see you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Smile. Thank you very good. much. Bye. -bye. Bye.
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that was Dr. Gerard Liberidian, a uh, former uh, deputy foreign minister of Armenia uh, and also senior advisor. I'm reading this not to screw it up again as, as I did in the beginning and secretary of the Security Council of Armenia and ambassador at large. As I said, it was an enormous honor for us to speak with uh, the gentleman, and um, I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. If you did, uh, and if there is a um, an interest in supporting our channel, under the description of the video, we have a couple of links through which you can do that. In general, the biggest support that you can give us is your interest, sharing our content, discussing it under the video, uh, participating in the chat. I thank everybody for asking very interesting questions. Sorry I couldn't get to all of them. Um, I truly believe that these sorts of conversations um, between our people directly, um, they're doing good. Um, they're doing good for all of us. Uh, recently speaking to one of our Georgian um, guests, I used a Russian proverb where three people in the same boat. Um, I, I believe it's a reference to a movie. The three of us, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, are in the same boat. And which way we're rowing uh, towards Russia, away from it, towards peril, or away from it, is probably a collective effort. Two cannot move in one direction and the other pulling in the other. It's just not going to work otherwise. Um, we position our channel and we see our channel as a space for all three countries, all three governments, um, civil societies, to come and speak directly to the audiences in all three republics. We try to provide Russian language content. We understand that English is not accessible. It's not as accessible in the region. Uh, more people understand Russian than they do English, uh, but sometimes it is impossible to speak to our guests in uh, another language. So I hope you forgive us. Uh, I see a lot of questions about subtitles. Um, it's an enormous effort, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, there are only two of us working on this channel. We don't have a team of producers. We don't have a team of interpreters and translators. And uh, I'm a control freak. I would have to do it all myself. Thank you for your time today. I hope to see you soon in the future.